talk of morality in terms of the Forsyte family is to talk of the practical rather than the ideal. The Forsytes don't approve of what they call immorality because it threatens the solid structure of society, their society. There's always a danger, they feel, that property may be diverted from the family into dubious and even uncontrollable hands. So I was aware, as I drove from Chelsea to Mayfair, that I was already condemned. Yet, I could think only of Helene and our child that was coming. A loved child, if ever there was one. I've really no idea, June. But I wanted to tell him about the wedding. Yes, dearest. Well, you can tell him tomorrow. Now, look, run upstairs. There's a good girl. Nanny's waiting for you. But say thank you to Cousin Soames first. Thank you, Cousin Soames. It was very kind of you to bring us home. <laughs> really, children nowadays. No manners whatsoever. But it was kind of you, Soames. Oh, the heat in that room. I'm exhausted. Francis, did anything happen to upset you? I mean, is there upset anything... Upset me? No, of course not. Only the heat. Appalling, wasn't it? But it was a lovely reception. And Winifred looked very happy. I'm so glad for her. Yes. Oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> really, the hats this year are too much. Well, Soames, I really mustn't keep you any longer. You've already done far more than your cousinly duty, and I'm really most grateful. Hello, Soames. Soames very kindly brought us back from the reception. So early? June was tired. Yes, of course. Now you must get back. I'm obliged to you. Not at all. I looked everywhere for your father, but he'd already gone. I saw him go. He seemed distressed about something. You don't miss much, do you? No, I try not to. And I might add, things are being said. Are they indeed? It's none of my business. None at all. But I'd take care if I were you. Yes, but I'm not much good at that, Soames. Thank you. Goodbye. Well, don't say I didn't warn you. Francis. Not now, please, Joe. I have a raging headache. I'm sorry. Did you hear what Sam said? Of course. Do you know what he was hinting at? Joe, please. Do you? I am not blind or deaf, and I am not totally stupid. No, of course not. Well, what have you heard? <sighs> Very little. You don't imagine I'd listen to poisonous gossip, do you? But I've guessed a great deal. For instance? That you're keeping a woman somewhere. Chelsea, isn't it? You didn't guess that? No. No, that, I think, was your dear Aunt Julie. Someone else casually mentioned the number of the street. I can't remember which particular cat that was. But you don't know the woman's name. Is that important? It is to me. Oh, naturally. But why should I care? One creature of that sort is very much like any other, I imagine. Now, this case is perhaps a little different, Francis. You'll have to know because... I want to know nothing. Nothing at all about it. After all, it isn't an uncommon situation. Filthy and degrading, of course. Especially for you, but not uncommon. The thought of it doesn't hurt you. I'm not jealous, if that's what you mean. After all, it isn't as if we were exactly young lovers. In fact, we're not lovers in any sense of the word, are we? So just keep me out of it, Joe. And when you change this mistress for another, as you will, I don't wish to know anything about her either. And you'd be content for us to continue living together on those terms? Have I any choice? But there is one thing I should like to know because it does concern me. And that is why you had to be such a fool about it. Apparently our dirty linen is on show all over London. So if you must indulge in these sordid affairs, try to be a little more discreet about them. For June's sake, if not for mine. Scandals soon die down if there's nothing new to feed them on. This one won't. I've had a note from my father. He wants to see me immediately. Then you'd better go. Only when I've said what I have to say. Please. In a sense, you've made things easier for me. <laughs> now, please don't interrupt. Just, just listen. Now, you'll be content for this situation to remain as it is as long as everything is kept quiet and respectable. Well, I can't live like that, and I don't intend to. I have to choose, Francis, between living with you or with 
Elaine Hilmer. And I choose Elaine. Hilmer? Not Fräulein. Oh, I see. Well, that explains a great deal, doesn't it? The whole thing's even grubbier than I thought. Oh, Joe, how could you? Under our own roof, it's disgusting. Francis, you're avoiding the issue. I want you to divorce me. Divorce? Are you telling me that you want to, to marry this, this common little governess? Yes. I want to marry her. You're out of your mind. She's going to have a child, Francis. My child. Oh, oh, how romantic. How quite delightful for you both. But I don't, really don't see how that affects anything. She won't be the first slut to have bastards. Yes, Joe, and better men than you have fathered them. Oh, Simpson, will you call me a cab, please? I'm going out. Well, thank goodness that's over. Oh, Soames, dear, you've been wonderful. What your father and I would have done without you. Went quite well. Yes, dear, it did. But did you ever see such a collection of stuffy people? Well, just what I was oh. saying to young Partridge. George, you startled me. I'm sorry, Aunt, but as I said to young Partridge, everywhere you look, Nothing but foresights, droves and herds of foresight. Male and female created he them. Superb. George, dear, are you drunk? Not in the least. Slightly uh, elevated, perhaps. Uh, then may I suggest that you go home now? You know we're all dining with your parents tonight. Excellent. If I'm wanted, I shall be at my club. He is drunk. If I am, aunt, you're to blame. I ah, yes. Thirsty work, this marriage, as Prince Arthur once remarked. Oh, did he really? The dear prince. When? In the year uh, 1501, I believe. Goodbye, all. But uh, I don't understand. That's all right, Mother. He wasn't referring to the Duke of Connaught. Oh. Now, don't you think we ought to go up and change? Oh, yes, indeed. Your father will fuss if we're late. Oh, one moment, though. What was it I came in here for? Ah, yes. Watson. Watson. You've been so helpful. Thank you, madam. Now, I do hope there's something special for you all tonight in the servants' hall. Yes, madam, Mr. Soames has arranged for an ample sufficiency. Ah, good. And we're all looking forward to toasting the happiness of Mr. and Mrs. Darty. Splendid. <sighs> something wrong? No, not really. Everything's been perfect. Except one tiny thing, perhaps. Your Uncle Jolyon never said goodbye. So unlike him, I thought. Yes, he left early. Joe wasn't here, you know. I think that upset him. Oh, dear me, yes. That wicked young man to hurt his father so. Then poor Francis. Oh, she won't take it lying down. But as for Uncle Jolyon, if I'm any judge, there's a great deal more trouble to come. Well, there it is, Father. Not a very edifying story, I know, but I hope you'll agree that the decision I've made is, well, both right and honourable. Right! Honourable! So you don't know what you're talking about. You're telling me it's right to abandon your wife? That it's honourable to drag her into a divorce action through scandal and mud? It's a pretty sort of honour. Maybe you're right. Perhaps I shouldn't have used those words. No, by God, you shouldn't. Perhaps they're only for other people. Moralists, preachers, judges. All those people with a vested interest in things as they are. The established order of society. Which I belong to. And so do you. You've accepted the benefits of this ordered society and don't pretend you haven't. Father, I'm trying desperately hard not to pretend any longer. I've accepted, of course I have, the easy way of life you've given me. But ever since I've been old enough to, to look clearly and think for myself, I realise that I'm, I'm nothing. I do nothing, I create nothing, I produce nothing. I'm a parasite living on your 
Kindness and generosity. Never heard such nonsense. Why, Joe, everything I've done has been for you. First for your mother and then for you. That's the whole point. Our father did the same for us, all of us. None of us started from the bottom. But he did. His father was fairly small beer. Yeoman stock, farmers down Dorset Way. His grandfather had drive and vision. He came up and took a look at London. The place was growing like a mushroom. Houses needed everywhere, so your grandfather built them. Thousands of them. Good, practical houses. He built them and they built his fortune. Ten children he had. Six sons. And he educated us. Not Eton and Cambridge like you, Joe. <laughs> but well enough, well enough. Each son got ten thousand pounds to himself. And there was enough for the girls. Well, that's what we built on. The education and the money that our father gave us. Look at us now, one of the best respected families in London. Do you ever hear your uncles complain about the start he gave us? Do I complain? I do not, because that is the way it should be. A family growing in prosperity because it is a family. Pushing up the social ladder. Each son higher than his father. The aristocracy of wealth. What? Oh, why not? Just as good as the other sort. Better in some ways. We don't squander our money. We invest it. Shipping, steel, textiles, overseas trade. And it's our capital that's built this country's wealth, and don't you forget it. Why, Joe, this ordered society you object to is just a, a collection of families like ours. I know, Father. I'm well aware of it. And you, you choose to opt out. I wouldn't if there was anything useful for me to do inside. But in any case, I shan't have the choice, shall I? Your society will see to that. They'll call the tune. They'll accept Francis, who doesn't love me, and reject Elaine, who does. Well, if they reject her, by God, they reject me. The question is, Father, where do you stand? It's a hard question. Hardest I've ever had to answer. So I'll ask you one or two first. Very well. If Francis agrees to divorce you, what do you intend to live on? I've been accepted in the syndicate at Lloyd's. Insurance? What do you know about insurance? Well, nothing, but I can learn. Needs capital. How much? Five thousand. I've already deposited the securities. I see. All the money your mother left you. Well, all but a thousand. We can live on that to begin with. Syndicates pay their accounts three years in arrear. Are you aware of that? Yes. When your income does start, it'll be £250 a year. <laughs> Families have lived on a lot less. In a very bad year, it might be nothing. I know. What about Francis? She has her own money. I made over the settlement. Her parents are well-to-do. I don't think they'll come down too hard on me. People can be vindictive, though. Oh. And June. What about June? In all this mess you've created, have you once thought about June? Of course I have, Father, deeply. And I realize it's not possible to take her with me. I wish it were. But there again, I had to make a choice between June, who has everything... Except her father. I know! But she has a mother and two grandfathers and a grandmother and God knows how many uncles and aunts all ready to fuss over her and pet her and bring her up the way she should be brought up. She's rich. But Elaine's baby will be poor. He'll only have me. So where do you stand? Joe, I've never preached at you, and I don't intend to now. I'm getting to be an old chap, finished with passion and all that. I know the power of it, what it can do to a man. Think, Joe, you have a wife. Who despises me? Never mind, you married her. You made certain promises. You signed a contract, a firm contract. Now you're proposing to Welsh on it. I, that I never could abide. And I'm not going to condone it in you. You have duties, responsibilities to your wife, to June, and I must say it, to me. If you're going to run away from them. Well, Joe, I can't support you. Let's see. Well, what do you suggest? Francis is quite prepared to accept me with a mistress, as long as nobody hears about it. Do you agree? No. She's wrong to think it. 
You must give this girl up. Give her up? Yes, I can be generous on your behalf, and I will be. She'll be taken care of, and the child. Father, I couldn't dream of doing anything so cruel. It's a cruel world sometimes. But you brought this on yourself. You're not a boy. You make your own decisions. And if you make the wrong one, you can expect no help from me, now or in the future. So I tell you again, Joe, keep your contract. This isn't a business transaction, Father, although you seem to think it is. But even a business contract can be broken on agreed terms. Not this one. Because there's no honest basis of agreement. For all her faults, your wife is a good woman. She kept her side of the bargain. Has she? You have June. And nothing else. No, no affection. No comfort. No humour. No love. No son of my own. But I may have a son now waiting to be born. Am I not allowed to acknowledge him because of a contract made over ten years ago? Because of some rules laid down by that precious society you're so proud of? Oh, if that's the best they can do, I'd rather live in poverty and disgrace for the rest of my days. That's your decision. Goodbye, Father. Go. Look, boy. I've been harsh. I had to be. Make you see reason. But you won't, and there's an end of it. You're my son, and I will not see you destitute. Whatever you do, I'll give you half your allowance. The other half to Francis. It's like you to offer that. And no. From now on, Father, I make my own way. Fräulein Helmer, good evening. May I come in? Please do. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Well, oh, what a cosy little room. Are you quite comfortable here? Yes. I'm so glad. But aren't you going to sit down? After all, it is your house, isn't it? You know whose house it is. Why did you come? For several reasons. For one thing, I've never seen a love nest before. Oh, that is the polite word for it, I believe. I don't know that word. Well, you do now, Fräulein. It's a charming expression, don't you think? Almost idyllic. One has a picture of innocent, well, almost innocent rapture in warm and secluded surroundings. Yes, it's a pretty word for an ugly thing. Madame. Please don't interrupt me, Fräulein. And won't you sit down? You're not very tall, but if there's one thing I can't bear, it's a crick in the neck. Especially with the hats they're making us wear this season. Yes, that's better. After all, if we're going to have a little chat, we may as well be comfortable. Now then, where was I? Oh, yes. Yes, our English lesson. Do you know the word meiosis, Fräulein? No? Oh, but you should. All foreign ladies, especially governesses, should know the meaning of the word. Because in England nowadays, we employ it constantly. Oh, not the word itself, of course, but what it stands for. Let me give you an example. Cultivated English persons nowadays no longer talk of a stench or a stink. 
They refer to an unpleasant odour. Do you follow me? Adultery is called infidelity, or at worst, misconduct. A prostitute is a fallen woman. And a pregnant lady is described as being in a delicate state of health. That, Fräulein, is meiosis. Your meaning is quite clear. I'm glad. I wanted you to understand, because, of course, between us, this glossing over reality would be ludicrous. In conversation with you, therefore... Madame, I have no wish to converse with you. You speak like an English lady, but you behave like a German fishwife. So please tell me why you are here, and then go. Very well. It occurred to me that you might be ignorant of certain facts concerning your relationship with my husband. I don't think so. Oh, surely. You know, of course, that his father is a rich man. Yes. And that is why you decided to seduce him. You are used to riches. I'm not. No, but you'd like to be. Compared to you, madame, I am rich. I love the man who loves me. That's all I want. You love a poor man, and I hope you realize that. His father won't lift a finger I to I know help. all this. I know exactly the situation. Is there anything else? Yes. Yes, there is one thing. I'm going to pay you a compliment, Fräulein. I believe you're sincere. Thank you. But you're also a fool and short-sighted. So let me tell you. Love doesn't last long. And lust is over even sooner. And that's all there is between you two, lust and a, a sentimental attachment. Oh, while that lasts, you may be happy. The world well lost and so on, but just think of the consequences. Because of you, he will have given up everything. His home, financial security, his father's affection, and that means a great deal to him. Whether I divorce him or not, he will have lost his daughter and his friends. He'll drop right out of the life he's known. And into what? Can you make up to him for the loss of all that? Can you? Through years and years of growing indifference, you and he, isolated in a kind of limbo. Well, you may be that kind of genius. I doubt it, Fräulein. I doubt it. Madame. You wish to say something? I had an idea I'd find you here. Your cab is waiting. Joe! Joe, it was horrible! Oh, God, Joe! I stood up behind it! When she spoke about me as if I wasn't... Well, I'm not. And I know I'm not, and you know I'm not, so I didn't mind her. I was strong because we love each other. Nothing anyone says can alter that, however dirty and obscene well, the talk is true. <laughs> Then she began to talk about you, Joe. Thought you'd lose. Oh, she tried that, did she? Yes. And then I got frightened. Because I began to think. I started to believe what she said, and I believe it now. No, Yes, Helene. yes, she was right. You must leave me and go back to your family. Your father and children. You have affection for them, and they for you. She said so, and it's true. You must go back to them. You must go! Elaine. <laughs> Elaine, listen to me. No. Listen. I've just come from my father. That chapter's closed forever. Do you hear me? Finished, done with. Listen to me. You mustn't think about it ever again. Now. Quiet now. Quiet. Shh. Shh, my darling. Peace, only peace now. Only peace. Good morning, Mr. Soames. Good morning, Grandma. My father in? Not yet. 
But I'm expecting him. He has some appointments. Anything for me? Uh, let's see now. Yes, the Kesper Chancery case. Comes up Wednesday fortnight. Ah. Who's the judge? Buckleton, I believe. That old head. We shan't have a judgment this century. Oh, is there anything on the Ruffmore Colliery? An opinion from Dreamer, QC. Have you read it? Well, he suggests we drop the case. Does he, indeed? Well, what do you think? Well, Dreamer's a sharp advocate, Mr. Soames. He knows the way a jury is likely to jump, so if he's down for well, Perhaps he doesn't care for the fee. What did we mark the brief? Fifty guineas. Well, that should be enough even for Dreamer. I'll read the opinion. I still think we've got a case. Well, you might be right. <laughs> it's a fine morning, sir. Uh, I dare say, and late. Your mother caught me after breakfast, held me up. I don't know, they never seem to think a man has anything to do. Always some nonsense or other. This time it's a ball, if you please. She wants to give a ball. A ball? What for? Oh, you may well ask precisely what I said. What for? Well, for Winifred and Darty, now they're back from Nice. Oh. Post-honeymoon, she called it. What next? Nobody gives a ball for a married daughter. Precisely what I said. Precisely. And after all the expense of the wedding, that cost me a pretty penny, I can tell you. Mm. Now this... Well, we'll hear no more of it. Good. I put my foot down. Any more waste, I said, and we'll end up in Queer Street, I shouldn't wonder. Mm. Women, they're all the same. I think we're made of money. If there's nothing you want me for, there's an opinion I should read. Ruffmore Colliery. What? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Don't waste your time. Mr. Forsyth to see you, sir? Ah, oh, show him in. Oh, come in, Julian. I was expecting you. We should hope so. We made an appointment, didn't we? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, now, do you want Soames to stay as my partner? Thank you, no. Do you I wish to see James? Yes, of course, you've retired. Retired? Certainly not. Why should I retire? If he should do so, Uncle, I'm sure he'll let you know. Good morning. Soames! Sir. I will not have impertinence from you or anyone else. Do you understand? But you are right to stand up for your father. Ah, boy, don't sulk. I'm an old man, sorely harassed. Something I want to ask you. Your cousin, Joe. I've not heard from him for two months. But I understand he's left Chelsea. I believe so, sir. You know his address? No, sir. But you are acting for my daughter-in-law, I hear. Uh, that's true, we are. Uh, Soames has it in hand. She's just back from Leicestershire. I can't ask her. Uh, have you any idea where? Uh, no, but I have the address of his lawyers. Camberley and Mount Lincoln's Inn. Oh, and George has seen him at the hodgepodge. He's still a member. I'm obliged, you. I'll be in my room, Father. That young fellow. Cold fish. He's an excellent man of business. That I don't doubt. Let's get down to it. James, I want to see my will. You're going to change it? I'll tell you that when I've seen it. Oh. Our dear is Winifred and what's his name? Darty. Oh, they've settled in a Green Street. Good property, that. Freehold, too. Came to him from an uncle. Oh, they do very well there. Enjoy the honeymoon? Enjoy it? How should I know? Why shouldn't they enjoy it? Spent enough money, I know that. Going off to France. Bournemouth was good enough for us. There they are. All this rushing about. Didn't wonder if they caught something. Water's very bad there, they tell me. And, and do you want me to leave you? No, no. Sit down, James. When I read this, I want to talk to you. Mm. Here's your post, Mr. Soames. Nothing very special. Thank you. And this one, marked personal. Hmm? That's a lady's hand, I'd say. Oh, you would, would you? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah, very florid. Oh, Southwater postmark. That's Mrs. Heron. It's like her to prank it personal. Right, Gradman, bring me the trust file. Very good, sir. Let me know when it's ready and I'll come in and sign. Uh, no need for that. Uh, we'll send it around to you. Your man can witness your signature. Yeah. Daisy Jane. Yeah. 
Well, he's changed his will. I thought he might. Nothing for Joe, nothing at all. Cut right out. Mm. I didn't think he'd go that far. No, no, he's very bitter. Can't say I blame him. Everything goes to June, in trust, of course, with the life interest for Francis. That makes June a considerable heiress. Mm. Have you any idea how much? Oh, no, he keeps his business to himself. And make no mistake, he's a warm man. A warm man. Well, so he should be. Hasn't got my expenses. I dare say. Father, I've heard from Mrs. Heron. Oh, what does she want? To see me. Yeah. I have the most interesting news. It's pretty obvious what that is. Yeah. And as it will affect the trust, I should so much like to discuss it with you. She's asked me down to luncheon on Saturday. I suppose I shall have to go. Well, it's your time, but don't waste it. Nothing to be got out of them, except fresh air. No, no, no. You don't grow. No, sir. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Heron's in the kitchen. Did you just Billy, wait? Come here at once. Right, I know the way. Oh, thank you, sir. Foresight. I'm Irene Heron. I interrupted you, forgive me. Oh, not a bit of it. I can play all day long if I wish. No, no, please, go on. You like Schumann? So do I. Um, especially this piece. He wrote it as a love song, you know, for Clara. Well, this is the version by Liszt for the piano. Won't you finish it? Of course. Very well, Miss Helen. Not a quarter as well as I'd like to. Not a tenth as well as any good concert pianist. Well, there's plenty of time, surely. You're, you're still very young. Not young enough. Mozart made his debut at five. Five years old, imagine. And Mendelssohn at ten. And now Paderewski. Have you heard him? No? I did, two months ago in Paris. He's superb. So good it makes you despair. People like that make you feel, oh, I don't know, as if they were born knowing all the technique the rest of us spend years trying to learn. And then, if you please, they just go on getting better and better while we poor mortals limp further behind them. But forgive me, if you never feel that you're going to get anywhere near the top, then... You mean, why continue? Mm. Why, indeed, when the gap is so wide. But, uh, Mr. Forsythe, you're a lawyer. A clever one, my stepmama says. Oh. No, I'm sure it's true. So you must be ambitious, yes? Right. But will you ever become Lord Chancellor of England? That, that's not my um, line of country. My ambition, such as it is, doesn't look in that direction. Oh, but I see your point. Of course you do. Your talent is for the law, well and good. Who cares if you never sit on the wool sack? Very uncomfortable, that must be too, when you come to think of it. But surely you must reach, even if you can't grasp. I reach for what I know I can grasp. I go on reaching it till I get it. Lucky you. But in doing that, you, you extend yourself, don't you? And next time you stretch a bit further. In music, it's the same. I know. I absolutely know I can never be a Clara Schumann or a Paderewski. But I have a small talent, so I must develop it. <laughs> After all, it's the only one I've got. And you know what the Bible says about burying talents. 
My teacher in Paris is quite amusing about that. Mademoiselle Heron, he says. I speak French perfectly adequately, you know, but he refuses to believe it. Mademoiselle Heron. Somewhere, deep, deep down, there may be some tiny spark. So we shall dig and dig, and one day perhaps, who knows? Boom! A volcano. H he's wrong, of course. If I ever learn to play well enough to give pleasure to myself and perhaps to others, uncritical friends, that will be all. Will that be enough? I don't know. But I think I may have a gift for teaching. Well, does that need any more than just application or hard work? Oh, I think so. I indeed, I must hope so, because otherwise it would be plain drudgery. You'd be satisfied with such a life? Well, that I don't know yet. But anything can happen. Indeed it can. I, uh, I, I might find a new infant Mozart. Even here in Southwater. Well, why not? They have to come from somewhere, so why not here? Well, that would be a joy. Yes. I think I could be satisfied with that. Hmm. Life at second hand. That's hardly right for someone like you, if you'll forgive me for saying so. How much longer have you got in Paris? Six months. Then my diploma, I hope. I go back next week. Do you know Paris? A little. Or hardly at all. It's wonderful. I, I live in a convent, you know, on twopence a week. And we're guarded everywhere we go, like... like ladies in a harem. But still, it's fun. There's something in the air. Freedom, perhaps. Don't you think that's the one really important thing? I've always considered it overrated. Ah. That's because you're a man. You have it already. My dear Mr. Forsyth, how can I apologize for keeping you waiting? I know, I took an early train and walked along the front. Delightful, so invigorating. That will be Mr. Lomax. Well, at least you had Irene to keep you company. Has she played for you? A little. She plays admirably. Then I knew you'd think so. Such a clever girlie, aren't you, my friend? Mm. Mr. Lomax, ma'am. And lunch is ready. Thank you, Lily. Uh, hello, hello, Forsyth. How are you? I'm well, thank you. <laughs> I simply can't delay our news a moment longer, Mr. Forsyth. Oh, look Forsyth. here, I say. <laughs> Mr. Lomax and I are going to be married. <laughs> yes. Uh, may I congratulate you both? Thank, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. It was all settled last week. Uh, mind you, though, it's been looming for some time. Oh. <laughs> so, you see, there will be plenty to discuss after lunch. Uh, yes, indeed. <laughs> well, I must go and have a word with Cook. Uh, Willie, go along and attend to the wine. Oh, oh yes, certainly, my dear, of course. Irene, dear, will you bring Mr. Forsyth into the dining room? That's right. Miss Helen, are you not pleased? About this wedding, I mean. Of course. My stepmama's been lonely since my father died. And you? When you come back from Paris, may I call to see you? If you wish. I believe they have concerts down here during the winter. Perhaps we might go together. Yes. Yes, perhaps we might. Now, shall we go in? So clearly put to. Uh, don't you think so, Willie? No, mm, it may be clear to you, my dear, but it was all Greek to me, what? <laughs> Nonsense, Willie. You're not nearly so unworldly as you make out. <laughs> Is he, Mr. Forsyth? In my opinion, that would be nearly impossible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
You're not going, will you? Oh, I'll just uh, stroll down to the station with Forsyth, if he doesn't mind. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, a little breath of air after that magnificent luncheon. Yeah, well, <laughs> run along, then. Uh, just a, a little point or two you might clear up for me. Uh, nothing much, just a question or so. <laughs> See you at tea time, then. Oh, yes, I knew that, yeah. <laughs> So good of you to come and give us your excellent advice. And don't forget, we shall... We shall all be delighted to see you any time you feel like a taste of sea breezes. Don't please wait for a business occasion. You're very kind. I should like that. Goodbye, Mrs. Helen. Goodbye. Goodbye. Uh, goodbye, Miller. I really, I do wish sometime or other you would make an effort to be a little more so. I really, please attend when I'm speaking to you. Yes? In one of your moods, I see. I thought you were positively uncivil at luncheon. I beg your pardon. I thought I was rather specially polite. But you didn't say anything. Yes and no. Please and thank you. It's too bad of you. When, in fact, you can talk quite intelligently if you wish. I'm sorry. Uh, that nice Mr. Forsyth. Such a shy young man. You could have helped a little bit. I don't think he's shy. Of course he is. He hardly talked at all. Well, that's because... I think it's because he only speaks when he's got something he's got to say. But, but if we all behaved like that, there'd be no such thing as conversation. That depends upon what you mean by conversation. I really, not when I'm speaking to you, please. Sorry. Anyway, it didn't matter. You and Mr. Lomax kept the ball rolling. Somebody had to. I only hope Mr. Forsyth didn't notice anything were odd. You're being so silent, I mean. Anyone would think you positively disliked him. And even if you do... I don't dislike him. He seems a kind-hearted person, but I don't like him either. Why should I? Because he's useful to us, and would be more so. He's an extremely valuable connection. Is that why you like him so much? It never does any harm to have influential friends. But you'll find out, my girl, before you're much older. The Forsythes are an important and a wealthy family. I mean, really wealthy. What is more, I happen to know that this boy, Soames, is an only son. I must go now, but it's nice to see you looking so bobbish. It was good of you to come, George. An old lady has very few pleasures, and I like to hear what the young ones are doing. Their parents never tell me. That's probably because they don't know, and just as well, too. <laughs> You're a wicked boy. <laughs> Up to all kinds of mischief, I'll be bound. Where are you off to now? To my club. I have to see a man about a horse. Oh, that's, um, let me see. You belong to the hotchpotch. Yes, I remember now. Your Uncle Julian put up for it very many years ago. But they wouldn't take him because he was in trade. Oh, such nonsense. He was as good as any of them. Better than most, I'd say, but... Um... Yet they accepted Joe, didn't they? Yes, Aunt, they did. Eton and Cambridge, you see. Yes. yes. Do you ever see... I do occasionally, my dear Aunt, and we pass the time of day. But if you want to know how he's managing to live on bread and cheese and kisses, I'm afraid I can't tell you. Why? Because he doesn't confide in me. And what's more, I shouldn't care for it if he did. Thank the Lord, I say, for decent English reticence. But, George... I know. You've always had a soft spot for Joe. I, I don't mind him myself, except that he's such a fool about women. Now, don't you be cynical about that. It may happen to you one day, but I hope not. Oh, nothing happens to me. And if I can help it, nothing ever will. George, do you know where Joe is living? St John's Wood, I believe. St John's Wood. That's not I exactly... know, not exactly Foresight country, is it? But still, it's cheap. Cheap? And quite close to Lord's, too. So if he ever gets fed up with, uh, how shall I put it, with uh, extramarital bliss, <laughs> he can always go and watch the cricket. <laughs> You're a wretch, but you do me good. <laughs> well, then, 
We've had a delightful chat with Timothy. Delightful. And I must say, for a man who claims to be so poorly... If he is poorly, he's not himself at all. He seems to be in the most robust health. Well, there's a great deal of diphtheria in London just now. Quite an epidemic. Yes, he's very anxious about it. Then mm. all I can say is it appears to suit him. <laughs> well, um, goodbye, my dear aunt. Oh, Claude, are you leaving? Immediately. Oh. oh may I take you home? Thank you, dear. Oh, will you be so good as to call a cab? I'll certainly call one. Whether he'll answer is quite a different matter. <laughs> <laughs> Dear George, <laughs> such a droll. And what news of the young couple? Oh, splendid. They're dining with us tonight and we're going to the opera. When everybody's happy, then? Oh, blooming, I'm glad to say. Sometimes she looks positively pretty. A <laughs> nice, sensible child. Is there uh, any sign yet? Oh, of... good gracious, no. After all, Anne, they've only been married four months. Monty, darling, don't be such a clown. <laughs> now behave yourself. We'll be late, and you know how Papa fusses if anyone's late. Yeah, well, he's got nothing to be late for, I have. Monty, <laughs> please. Oh. I never get this done. It's practically impossible anyway. Why men have to wear such things? Of course it's to you, my love. <laughs> All right. <laughs> but keep still, do. Yeah. Monty, huh? shall we tell them? About what? We know perfectly well about what, shall we? Well, if we tell your mother, the whole of London will know in 24 hours. Do you mind? No, but well, a fellow comes in for an awful lot of chaff. C couldn't we postpone it? Well, not indefinitely, I'm afraid. Much as I'd like to spare your feelings, there comes a time. Oh, I suppose so. But tonight? Tonight. I shall tell Mama when we leave you after dinner, and if you care to break it to Papa over your port? Uh, mm. There. You look gorgeous. Worry, you'll be delighted. Oh, I dare say, but the trouble is, he'll go on about it, on and on. Look, I, I think we'll just let your mother tell him after we've gone, then he can complain to her that nobody told him anything about it before it happened. Now, what do you say? Hmm? All right, darling. But you're an awful coward. I know. Now, hurry up. Freddy, my love, there's um, a button loose on this. Do you think you'd get someone to fix it for me? Yes, of course. Do you want to wear it tomorrow? Yes, I'd like to. Then I'll do it myself. It won't take a minute. Thank you. Monty? Please come here at once. What's the matter? 